Hey, don't want to wait so long in between main channel meatball content? Well, check out some links in the description, because these thumbnails on screen are other videos you probably missed. How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the channel. So today, I figured I'd return to the Well of Tricks with another trash lock, this time of Brilliant Diamond version. And yes, I've heard your request in the comments of the last two. And for this run, I will be banning Kadabra. Just because it's teetering right on the 400 base stat total limit for these runs, doesn't mean it's actual trash. In fact, it was probably the most competent Pokemon I had used throughout both Crystal and Fire Red. So this time, it is gone. In its place though, I think we have a decent selection of Pokemon throughout the region. Staples like Graveler and Onix return though, I have access to Roselia Staravian Luxio, all of which are available early game in the effort to close the huge gap left by Cadaver's banning. Do you think I'll make it through without losing an attempt? Well, leave a comment below as we're jumping straight into it. Rules are also in the description if you're curious. I usually don't bring them up in the videos at this point since I've done so many challenges in the last, what, three years since I've been on this channel? It just doesn't feel like I need to do that. So they're there for your convenience and for newer viewers. With that said though, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Let's see if we can't hang with some trash. So my first Pokemon choice here is Hurtwig. Now this might seem strange, why don't I go for Chimcharts and we barely get any access to fire types? And that's because we don't actually need any fire types in Sinnoh. Plenty of other types fill in the purpose that fire would normally hold, such as fighting on ice or flying on bug, both of which are occupied by something like Machop or Metatite in the early game, or for flying of course we get Starly and eventually Staravia since that ends up being below the 400 base stat threshold. Turtwig is also super effective on the first gym, resistant to the second, and super effective against two out of the three from the fourth gym, giving me the highest statistical advantage for the early to mid game. Pre-Badge 1 gives me a boatload of encounters though, some of which can evolve like Bidoof on Route 201, but mons like Shinx on Route 202 don't quite hit over a 400 base stat total when evolving into Luxio, so I'm in pretty good shape. I train up a bit before handling the trainers, heading into Jubilife City, where three more encounters await me. Just to the west is Route 218, the gate of which houses the old rod so I can fish up Magikarp on said route. Now, this is not useful at all, but it does cut down an encounter that can potentially wall me from a future Barboach or Goldeen with the good rod if I don't grab it now, so I may as well use the Route 218 encounter on this slot. Route 204 to the north ends up yielding Badoo, a fantastic find for this early in the game since it evolves via Friendship, and therefore before Rourke. Into the strongest Pokemon I'll probably have access to, especially stat-wise, Roselia. At exactly base 400 stat total, I'm given access to a base 100 special attack with a base 65 speed. So, it's not exactly the fastest attacker, but it does put in Kadabra's place a little bit more of a pulled back version with a, a suboptimal typing. So it's not exactly the best thing, but it's probably a more balanced version of what I should have had with Gadabra. Lastly, in the Ravage Path houses Zubat, the better encounter for this area seeing as Geodude has plenty of places to find him before Rourke. Not that it matters since it doesn't get any ground moves before him anyway. Speaking of Geodude though, I'm not getting to him before my first major rival fight on Route 203, as Barry starts with Starly and I go with Shinx, blasting it with a Thundershock as Quick Attack lands for around a quarter, doing another quarter as a second critical Thundershock takes him out. Chimchar takes the field second, so I swap into Bidoof, taking a scratch before getting off a single tackle in for minimal damage as I take a second one, putting Bidoof too low to stand up to another one. So I swap into Turtwig, hitting a tackle as two Leers come my way, then I swap into Zubat to get rid of those Leers, taking another one, then firing off a Supersonic as Scratch hits for half, confusing Chimchar as I go back into Turtwig. Leer does hit on Switch in though, but it's not enough since I'm still at full HP and Chimchar is not. So, Scratch doesn't even do a fourth, meaning three tackles is enough to finish the job at this point, KOing Chimchar through three scratches. Not bad at all if I do say so myself. But with him out of the way, I can get my Route 203 encounter in Starly and Geodude in the Orberg Gate before getting into the city itself. Quickly moving south into the Orberg Mine, where the only new encounter here in Onyx resides. A very strong mom with a base 160 defense, but not really too much else. 
Onyx should be at least a good way to stall during the early game, and with level up moves like Smackdown and Rock Slade, it should be a decent attacker come mid game as well, but probably not much further than that. The last area I can get an encounter in before taking on Rourke is Route 207, but it doesn't have much. Thankfully though, I can probably get one of the best encounters here in Krikatot. And you may be asking, wait a second, isn't Krikatot absolute dog water? Yes, yes it is. But thankfully, Krikatoon doesn't have a base stat total of over 400, but it still has a respectable enough physical attack so that moves like X, Scissor, and Slash should still be really powerful, especially when paired with Sword Stance once I hit the Veilstone City department store. With some training to the level cap out of the way though, it's time for Rourke and he's got three Pokemon, very strong for the first gym leader, but when all of them are weak to grass, I've got a nice clean advantage here. First up is Geodude, which I lead Turtwig against, hitting Razor Leaf for the one shot, no sturdy here folks, leading to Onyx, who does have sturdy, as my newly evolved Roselia learns Magical Leaf in case Turtwig gets too beat up here. Onyx dodges my first Razor Leaf, but the second brings him down into sturdy, and a regular potion isn't enough for Onyx to heal back to full, meaning Leafage is still plenty enough to take the KO, leaving just Granados. Even with this little HP lost from a rock throw, I'm still worried about Kranidos, and when the first headbutt gets the flinch, I know I'm in a little bit of trouble, so I risk the crit going for another Razor Leaf, and when the second hits, it's now or never, and thankfully there's no flinch, and thankfully, the Razor Leaf hits, KOing with one attack to secure the win and the coal badge. Not to mention, Starly evolves at this level. Staravia will certainly be an MVP for Gardenia. After healing up and buying some repels, I backtrack into Jubilife, taking out the first instance of Team Galactic, then proceeding north into Route 204 and through the Rock Smash Rocks of the Ravage Path, into the north area of the route, eventually making it into Floroma Town. Now, there's a few encounters around the areas subsequent to here, namely the Floroma Meadows, Route 205, and Valley Windworks, all three of which have honey trees. I'm not too worried about them until Team Galactic is worn down though, so I slather them before making it to Mars. This is the first admin fight, and despite having a strong Perugly for this point in the game, Geodude and Onyx kind of make this fight a bit of a cakewalk. Also, I should mention, yes, I have 999 of a few different berries at this point. I figured that since I was able to obtain all of these berries at this point, I could just plant them take a bunch of time and grow 999 of them theoretically, so I just cut out the time in order to give you this video faster and to save my sanity since Oran Berries are quite helpful early game. They also help me not waste money on healing items, which is much better served for repels and eventually TMs in Veilstone City. Anyway, Mars time and she leads off with a Zubat. One, while it makes sense to lead off with Geodude or Onyx here, this Morbius looking mother has absorbed, so I go ahead and lead with a newly evolved Luxio, shocking it with Thundershock to KO and lead into Perugly. I'm expecting Fake Out here, so I swap into Onyx, taking three damage uh, before taking a Growl and walking her into Dragon Breath. Even though this barely does any damage, I'm just trying to get the paralysis on this fat cat while it attempts to wear down my Onyx, and on the third shot, I do end up getting it, taking a few thieves in the process as I swap into Geodude. From here, I figured I can get away with an attempted defense curl, rock polish, rollout sweep. Though even with a rock polish setup, it's still not enough to outspeed a paralyzed Perugly. Just uh, goes to show you how slow a floating stone with fists is. Either way, rollout is able to finish the fight rather quickly, with Geodude attempting to learn Smackdown, in which I pass on it, since rollout is just a net better move at this current moment in time. Not to mention, Onyx will fill the role of being the rock attacker that doesn't get locked in. Luxio also learns Spark here, a physical electric type move that thankfully lets me take advantage of Luxio's most advantageous attacking stat, and therefore, you know, just makes it net better. With that though, it's time to wait for some honey trees to be ready for encounter, and thankfully I've got some new mons to grab once that timer is elapsed. Two of them ended up having Combi, one of which I actually caught in the Floroma Meadows, and the other ended up being Burmy in the Valley Windworks. I didn't really want to wait around until Friday to grab myself a Drifloon here. I didn't think it would be very useful anyway, seeing as a much better ghost type will be coming shortly down the line, but I digress. With Round 205's Honey Tree not yielding anything new, I took the time to search the grass to find a Shellos. And while I can't use Gastrodon, this should be at least a decently tanky water type capable of learning things like Ice Beam and Mudslap for good coverage and accuracy deprivation respectively. 
After running through Route 205 comes a turn of forest, and I refuse to grab another encounter while running around with Cheryl. I do not need that Chansey to KO my potential beauty fly encounter. I need that in Dust Ox more than anything. If you recall back to my poison only Nuzlocke of Brilliant Diamond a few months back, you'll recall that Dust Ox actually annihilated most of the league thanks to Quiver Dance. Hilarious to think that a Pokemon considered unanimously terrible is able to sweep through a Sinnoh League, one of the most difficult leagues in mainline Pokemon history, with a move that was introduced in Gen 5 to make bug types more viable simply because most of them suck. Anyway, I'm rambling too much. My actual encounter for the Eterna Forest ends up being exactly what I hoped for, a Wormpole. Now with this and whatever it evolves into, I should be able to use another Honey Tree on a future route to obtain the other half of the evolution chain. I'm not bothering to use it at the moment simply because I'm grinding through trainers with Pokemon I don't necessarily intend on using throughout the league, and therefore don't really care about EV training properly. But depending on what form that Wormpole evolves into, I need to plan accordingly. The second half of Route 205 provides no trouble for me, letting me step foot into Eterna City and into the last stretch before the second badge. Two more areas for encounters, thankfully after the gym trainers, those being Route 207 where I can find Metatite, Pretty good substitute for Metacham and Gallade if I'm looking for this unique type combination, capable of being a great mixed attacker with workup to boost both stats while also having access to powerful moves with status chances like Force Bomb, and strong, infinitely obtainable TMs like Psychic. Lastly, it's in Mount Coronet, which happens to be Leffa. I can actually evolve this into Clefairy, giving me one of the few fairy types this game has to offer without the including of Gen 5 and onward Pokemon, but enough diatribe, let's fight Gardenia. She's got three Pokemon, first being Cherubi, so I go with Simorg, Bird of Sovereignty, in order to special summon an Apex Avian from deck in the end phase. Wait, what do you mean it's banned? This is a joke to get you to subscribe to the TCG channel. The Meatball Man would like to hit 3,000 subscribers over there by the end of July. I knew investing in that robot was a good idea. Anyway, let's go ahead and take out this fight in three turns, because one wing attack does the trick on all three of the Pokemon, Cherubi, Turtwig, and Roserade, despite outspeeding and using Grass Knot, it does not stand a chance against my Staravia and the power of Wing Attack. This earns me the Forest Badge, and in a grand total of three turns, that does not sound pretty bad. And to think that I had Zubat in the back in case things went south. Two badges in hand, it's time to go take out Team Galactic to proceed, in which none of the trainers provide any difficulty all the way up until Jupiter. She's only got two Mons, just like Mars did, starting with Zubat as I go with Onyx, using Smackdown as I figured a super effective 50 power move with 100 accuracy would take it out, but looks like I should have taken the slight risk with the 90% accurate Rock Slide, barely not KOing as Absorb does around a quarter. Sucks to be quad weak, but a second Smackdown is enough to tit the job done as Skuntang comes in second. Now this guy is a powerhouse, having Flamethrower and Snarl, the latter of which does some pretty massive damage to Onyx after a single Rock Slide does relatively minimal damage. So I swap into my own Zubat, taking Snarl for less than half, then landing Super Asonic to get some confusion. But Skuntank powers through and hits a Flamethrower to nearly KO Zubat, so it's off to Bidoof in the hopes that I can do some more damage. I end up seeing a confusion hit upon switch in, allowing me to get off a yawn as she of course makes up for said confusion hit with a critical flamethrower. Knocking Bidoof below half before triggering the Orenberry, but I stay in, taking a second, using the defense curl, then upon Skuntang falling asleep, using rollout in the attempt to KO. Three manage to hit in a row while she stays asleep, barely not getting the KO though, as Skuntank wakes up and causes the first fatality of the run with flamethrower, KOing Bidoof though Geodude's easily able to come in and finish it off with another rollout, taking aftermath damage in the process but not going down. Well that's a shame, Bidoof actually put in some good work, though I think I'll have plenty of Mons that will have to go down if I'm gonna get through this run because Sinnoh is a hard region. With her done though, I can grab the Explorer Kit and the bike, though the former is more interesting. I'm gonna be holding off on getting the encounter down there for as long as I can until a practically unwinnable fight comes up where I need an easy out and hopefully the underground will contain said out to whatever situation that may come. After all, I have plenty of mods currently, I should be fine. Proceeding down into Route 206 gives me Stunky as my encounter, a decent one, but unfortunately unable to evolve into Skun Tank per the 400 base stat total rule. Route 208 on the other side of Mount Coronet ends up having Psyduck, a nice little water type, which I don't have too many of, so I will definitely take it. 
Moving into Heart Home City and having a little bit of an I don't give a sh please leave me alone moment with my mother, we've got another rival battle on our hands, and while Barry has four Pokemon this time around, it doesn't make him very difficult. He starts off with Starly, so I go Luxio to one shot with Spark as Buizel comes in second. I guess Barry hasn't learned his type matchups, using Tail Whip as it immediately goes down to Spark afterwards. Roselia comes in third and is outsped and hit with Luxio's bite, flinching, then doing the same thing next turn as a third bite KOs without a single mark on Luxio, leaving just Monferno. Now this guy's physical and Luxio's at minus one defense from that tail whip, so after hitting a single spark for a little less than half, I swap into my defensive behemoth Onyx, going for Rock Slide and Smackdown after taking minimal damage from a Flame Wheel and Mach Punch, KOing and winning the match. Nothing to worry about him until, you know, the league. <laughs> Barry really is not a threat in this game whatsoever. And now, because I said that, he's probably going to do something drastic and mess up my endgame team, isn't he? There is approximately a 67% chance of defeat at the hands of Barry. Alright, maybe the robot wasn't the best choice. Never tell me the odds, asshole! <sighs> There's a good string of routes up ahead, with 209 giving me Mime Jr. along with the Good Rod, and the Lost Tower ends up housing Ghastly. Now, Ghastly is a powerhouse in the special side, akin to Kadabra. It can't evolve into Haunter, though, without going over the 400 base stat total limit, so while we'll have a strong special attacker, if I don't one-shot everything, Ghastly's toast. Salishion Town is just ahead, in which I don't even grab an unknown from the ruins, because those things will never be useful, leading to Route 210. Here, I'm going to be waiting on the northern section for an encounter, moving into Route 215 and slathering the honey tree here while taking out all the trainers and getting into Veilstone City. Finally, Power Central! There are so many TMs obtainable here of high power levels like Ice Beam, Flamethrower, Psychic, Thunderbolt, Protect, Reflect, Light Screen, and a few other useful ones. And I know I've got a few mons to teach stuff to. It would be a little bit too much to go over though, so you'll see which ones end up being relevant later. Before leaving, I make sure to take on the Veilstone City Gym Trainers, where I do have a little bit of a scare with one of the trainers that has a few Machokes, but I manage to make it out thanks to Ghastly's Curse without any losses. Though I'm heavily reminded that mistakes like this usually come as a result of attempting to keep my team at the same level as much as possible, even more so with more than six Pokemon that I'm trying to balance and rely on. Round 2 14's to the south, housing plenty of trainers as well as a new fishing encounter in Goldeen. Though I hold off since I've got plenty of water types at the moment. If worse comes to worst and both Psyduck and Shellos go down, I'll make sure to grab Goldeen. Speaking of water type encounters though, Route 2 13 houses a few in the grass where I managed to find Wingull. No Pelipper for me, but Water Flying is a nice type combo. Though it will definitely be surpassed later on in the run once we hit Mantike as an available encounter. With all that said and done, I'm finally in Pastoria City, taking out the Gym Trainers and allowing the battles against Maylene and Crasher Wake to be as close to back-to-back -to -back as I can get them. Maylene's first, starting off with Metatite as I go with Mime Jr. Yeah, I've completely revamped Mime Jr.'s moveset to be Light Screen, Reflect, Calm Mind, and Baton Pass. The first two, of course, are obtainable in Veilstone, but the TM for Calm Mind is actually in the Grand Underground, so a dip down there gives me access to a Knife Sweep mechanism, not to mention, there's an item down there called the Light Clay, extending the turns of Light Screen and Reflect, and basically giving me a perfect turn window to get six Calm Minds up. Meditite also only knows Drain Punch as a damaging move, and Mime Jr., thanks to the Fairy Typing, that actually gives it a quad resistance, therefore making it the perfect tool to set up with. This goes about how you'd expect. Reflect, Drain Punch, Calm Mind a whole bunch, Light screen, the turn before Reflect wears off, Reflect again, then Baton Pass over to Ghastly. Ghastly has a great immunity here, with only Machoke being able to hit for super effective damage, but she makes the mistake of swapping into Machoke the turn after I Baton Pass into Ghastly, swapping into a Hex that KOs upon entry. Metatite's back out, and thanks to two flashes that were used earlier in the fight by Metatite that got passed on from Baton Pass, Ghastly is missing a little bit, but the third attempt at Hex KOs Metatite, leaving just Lucario. Now this guy has Metal Claw, which can hit for some decent damage, but that's what Reflect is for, and thankfully I don't have to worry about it, as Ghastly just one-shots with Psychic after outspeeding to win. Now that is teamwork. Even the smallest of baby Pokemon like Mime Jr. can help set up an entire sweep single-handedly. After taking out Team Galactic and getting Dawn's Pokedex back though, it's straight to Crasher Wake and our halfway point in terms of badges. 
Just a side note here, the emulator started to freak out like mad during this fight and caused a bunch of flashing, so anybody sensitive to that, I recommend just scroll down so that you can still hear what happens. Crash Awake starts off with Gyarados as I lead once again with Mime Jr., setting up both screens yet again through Ice Fang and Crunch, giving me a little less than half HP to work with. But Brian is still unable to KO at this point, so I use a Calm Mind, then take a second Brian before Baton passing on over into Roselia. I wish I had gotten the chance to use one more Calm Mind, but I got Growth just in case. Roselia is able to take an Ice Fang with over half HP remaining. As Stun Spore lands, then I go for Giga Drain for over half, recovering every last point of damage that Ice Fang dealt, as it lands once again for less than half. Roselia is able to go ahead and grab the KO with a second Giga Drain next turn, nearly healing back to full as Quagsire's in second. <laughs> Dear lord, this is funny looking. Giga Drain one-shots Quagsire, nothing to be very surprised by, but I do rub some salt in the wound with a critical as Floatzel comes in last, using Ice Fang but missing, allowing for Giga Drain to grab the KO. Alright, no more having to maintain a level cap for multiple gym leaders, I can proceed linearly without hesitation and without irritation. Straight after Crash Your Wake ends up being another rival battle, and just like I expected, Barry is trying to do something dumb and take a member of my team. Starly is still on his team despite being level 26, so I use Luxio and Volt Switch, KOing and going into Krikatoon as he brings out Monferno. I'm using this to bait Flame Wheel in order to go into Onyx and wear it down with my own Rock Slide, but things start falling off the wheels here. He uses Leer instead of Flame Wheel, going for Power Up Punch next as I go for Rock Slide, barely doing above a quarter and giving him effectively plus 2 over Onyx in terms of attack. So I swap into Ghastly to be immune to fighting, but Flame Wheel will 100% KO here. So I swap back into Onyx, realizing that he's holding a Shell Bell as the Citrus Berry heals Onyx, so then I go back into Ghastly and attempt to Hex, thankfully KOing with a critical hit. Not sure if I needed that with Ghastly's massive special attack, but alas, he goes into Boizel, using Bite as I swap into Luxio, taking a Tail Whip, and Volt Switch gets the KO here forcing him into Roselia as I go into Krikatoon for a good resistance, taking it out in a single X-Scissor to clean it up. Monferno was almost a tragedy, but thankfully we got through him. Probably should have put Psychic back on Ghastly, but, you know, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. This just leaves two more fights with him coming up soon, though. As for fights that matter, well, there's nothing in between here in Fantina other than a few Team Galactic runs. Not even Cyrus bothers to fight us in Celestic Town like he does in Platinum, so let's just jump into the specter of a team that Fantina has on offer. She leads with a Drifblim, and I just handled one of these two levels lower in the gym, so this should be a Cakewalk. Sadly though, Drifblim outspeeds with that two level difference, doing nearly half with Hex as Spark gets the KO and Aftermath triggers, effectively ridding me of my Citrus Berry as Gengar comes in second. I figured I'd be able to use Volt Switch here after outspeeding Drifblim, but no dice. I got a hard switch and my best option is Stunky, taking a Sludge Bomb for nearly half despite resisting, getting it with Confuse Ray but still getting through, eating up Gengar's Culber Berry by using Night Slash for around two thirds. I'm not exactly planning on using Stunky for much else in this run though, so I figured I'd stay in and see if I can get the Fluke KO with another Night Slash, and somehow I do, surviving on 2 HP from a Dazzling Gleam and not hitting itself a confusion, Stunky has somehow fluked its way into a KO and into Miss Magius, so I guess he gets to fight on another day. I swap out, because of course it would be dumb to sack Stunky, so I swap into Staravia to get the Intimidate drop, not that it does anything with an all special Miss Magius, though Dazzling Gleam does around half, with some of that being healed off from the Citrus Berry, though it's for not as a Confuse Ray causes Staravia to hit itself. Well, since I know that Fantina will not go for a Ghost-type move on a Normal-type, I swap into Ghastly to take the Dazzling Gleam, taking less than half, but of course Miss Magius outspeeds next turn using Phantom Force. Well, yeah, I guess I gotta swap back into Staravia on it, since it's a two-turn move, and I'm completely safe if I do. Able to use Thief for around half afterwards after dodging a Dazzling Gleam, doing the same thing next turn through a Confuse Ray to KO. No range needed thanks to that handy Expert Belt that I managed to grab from Miss Magius. Unfortunately, I don't get to keep the item like you would in the original Gen 4. That would be pretty useful for later fights probably, but I'll survive. After all, I've already managed to survive with only two deaths up to this point. With Fantina wrapped up, it's only a hop and skip over to Canalave City where our next rival battle takes place. Wow, talk about deja vu, first arrival battle, then immediately the gym leader. 
Barry's a bit tougher this go around, finally adding Heracross to the team, as well as evolving Starly, though it's nothing I can't handle. I lead Luxio against Staravia like I did last time, dodging a quick attack in order to one-shot with Thunderbolt, leading to the new Heracross. I figured that I would wait for Volt Switch here, and I do get it off, taking a Brick Break for around 75%, as Volt Switch gets some good damage, allowing for me to swap into Staravia for Intimidate, though it doesn't matter as I outspeed and nail Aerial Ace for the KO. Third out is Buizel, so I take the time to use U-Turn, doing around 70% and getting out of dodge into Beautifly, dodging a Tail Whip as Bug Buzz lands for the KO. Jeez, this uh, friendship mechanic is really getting out of hand here. I hard swap into Onyx as Monferno comes out, taking a Flame Wheel for little damage as Mach Punch lands next turn, taking Onyx to a little above half, though I'm not going to risk any potential critical hits, so I swap into Ghastly to be immune to said Mach Punch, KOing next turn with Psychic. See, I did eventually remember it. It's all over at this point though, since Roselia comes in last, gets blasted with Psychic, and falls, winning me the bout. Barry's got one more attempt in this run to fuck this up for me, though I hope he doesn't try to make that one count. I need as much advantage as I can going into that league as possible. Unfortunately, while I was going through the Canalave Gym with my myriad of water types that I've caught though, Wingle ends up being caught by an errant Thunderfang from a Steelix. Thunderfang? from a Steelix. Now I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure a big ol' hunk of metal shouldn't be having electricity coursing through it, even if it's grounded. But I say that this is a pretty massive loss for my strategy going into Byron. See, both his Steelix and Bastiodon have Sturdy, which work like the modern version, where if you get one hit KO'd, you don't. Meaning I've got to bait out a way of breaking Sturdy without losing too many Mons, and Wingle was going to be a perfect pivot Mon for the ground-type Steelix. I don't mind sacking a few not planned for Candace, Volkner, or the League though, but I don't want to lose too many options. I decide on a team though and head in, starting off with Luxio against Bronzor. I've got a held Personberry for the Confuse Ray, and I'm hoping that I can get that burned up, plus a flinch off of Bite to get him down enough for Volt Switch to KO and go from there, but I did not realize he would prioritize Trick Room and Sandstorm over Confuse Ray. Alas, my first bite doesn't flinch, and those get set up immediately, with the second bite bringing Bronzor into the red, forcing a full restore as I go for Volt Switch. I was pretty tilted at this point because my strategy didn't end up working, otherwise I probably would have continued using Bite, but I'm going into Magikarp here. I don't know why, I just am. I swap back at Luxio to tank a Flash Cannon for next to nothing as I go for Thunderbolt, taking a Confuse Ray finally and burning my Person Berry as Thunderbolt brings him into the red once again. Well shoot, Trick Room is burned, I may as well try to KO, but a Hyper Potion stops that from going into effect, with Thunderbolt landing afterwards and doing just shy of half. So I don't risk a range, instead going for Bite to hope for the flinch here, but instead he swaps into Steelix, expecting the immunity from Thunderbolt as I accidentally break a Sturdy with Bite. Well, that wasn't exactly needed, since I can just swap into Zubat on Earthquake, then use U-Turn to outspeed before he goes for Thunderbolt, but instead of using Thunderbolt on Zubat, he goes for Sandstorm, which works out since I was already going into Graveler anyway, and thanks to this thing somehow being allowed to learn Flamethrower, I'm just able to use two of those, taking an Earthquake for less than half as Steelix goes down and Bronzor comes back in to get destroyed by Flamethrower is what I would say if Flamethrower finished it off instead of bringing it into the red and burning it, allowing for Trick Room to be set up once again. This actually puts me in a really nasty pickle, since now I can't wait out the Trick Room and swap between members of my party, since Bronzor can't dish out damage whatsoever. Now Bastiodon is 100% going to be able to come in and do a ton of damage while outspeeding my entire party for a few turns. This is fine though, I just go for another Flamethrower, KOing and allowing for Bastiodon to come in as the Sandstorm subsides. Alright, I gotta figure out how to wait out this Trick Room. So I swap into Zubat to take a Flash Cannon, then swap back into Graveler to take a Stone Edge, finally swapping into Shellos on a Flash Cannon, doing barely any damage as Trick Room finally elapses. Alright, this should be good enough. I swap back into Graveler expecting a Thunderbolt, but instead I see an Iron Defense. Not that it matters, I'm using special moves. So now that he's gonna use Flash Cannon, a move in which Magikarp resists, I can swap to it, take the attack, then outspeed and use Tackle to break the Sturdy, allowing it to be KO'd by Thunderbolt and finishing it off with Psyduck's Hydro Pump. Yeah, Magikarp actually had a purpose in this run. Getting sacked to break a Gym Leader Ace's Sturdy is not too bad for a Magikarp that's not allowed to evolve into Gyarados, if I do say so myself. Sadly though, <laughs> Psyduck's Hydro Pump doesn't actually KO Bastiodon from here. 
Rather, he survives in the red as the Citrus Berry heals him for a quarter, allowing for Thunderbolt to hit for a near KO, but the fact that Psyduck survived is a bit of a miracle. But unfortunately, my brain decides to go for the safer play and try KOing with Water Pulse, though it doesn't get the KO and Psyduck goes down, allowing for Shellos to come in and blast it with Water Pulse to secure the victory with the KO. Well, that was a bit rough. Losing two more members of my entourage isn't good, but thankfully, they're not some of the highest statted members like Graveler, Luxio, or Rosalia, so in all honesty, I do not care. As long as I win the challenge, that's the only thing that matters! Team Galactic Time wasters a plenty between badges 6 and 7, with boss fights against both Saturn and Mars, thankfully neither of them are necessarily too challenging or worth talking about. Nor do I take any losses against them. Though let me tell you, Mars took such a long time stalling out Perugly with Onyx that it was probably the longest battle I've ever had against a computer opponent in a Pokemon game without thinking involved. Anyway, let's just jump ahead into Candace. I finally grabbed my ace in the whole encounter in the underground for this one, grabbing Machop seeing as I missed it in every route it was available in Sinnoh. Though that begs the question, why not grab a fire type? You don't have one. Well, Houndoom is down there, but that's over 400 base stat total, and Houndour is only obtainable via breeding, so that's off the table. And since I'm using Brilliant Diamond, I don't have access to Magby due to being version exclusive. And since I want something that attacks for super effective damage as backup for Candice, I figured Machop would do. Not that it matters though, since we're going for Mime Jr. Cheese Strats once more. However, I'm not using the Light Clay here. Instead, I'm using an Ayapapa Berry so that I can use Reflect, then four Calm Minds, use one more Reflect and have enough HP to survive and use Baton Pass into Ghastly, all through a barrage of Snover using Avalanche. However, Snover has Mist as an available move and is likely to use it turn one, so I try to get away with using a Calm Mind before Reflect in order to give Ghastly one more boost, though boy this game's AI reads your input. Seriously, if I had clicked Reflect turn one, she would have used Mist, Thankfully, the game makes up for it in kind by having Mime Jr. dodge an avalanche the next turn as I use Reflect, with Mist coming the turn after. Now, I actually think this might be better than what was initially planned, as now Mist ends a turn after Reflect does, so after this chain of Calm Minds, I should have Reflect end, use it the next turn, Mist ends as I use Reflect the second time, then use Baton Pass on the turn that Snover uses Mist to set it back up. Did it work? Give it a nice guess and try to decide for yourself. Yeah, of course it didn't, because the game reads my damn inputs. Unfortunately, on the Baton Pass into Ghastly, I do take some damage from Avalanche, but it's less than half and I'm able to one-shot it with Shadow Ball as Sneasel comes out and eats a Dazzling Gleam for the one-shot. Third out is Metacham, and I know this thing can outspeed, which is why I wanted to avoid getting hit by Snover, but I suppose she didn't see a KO through the Reflect and instead went for Bulk Up, giving me a free KO with Shadow Ball. Well, thanks, game. Took you long enough to do the right thing and throw the match. Out comes a Boma Snow, and out it goes as Shadow Ball sends it to the Shadow Realm. This is a joke to get you to subscribe hey, to the TCG. Shut the f up! You already told them that. They're not stupid, regardless of what they put in the comment section. Whew. Easy enough. Time for the story to wrap up and the last patch. Alrighty, it's time for a barrage of stuff to get through before some boss fights, namely Lake Acuity, the Galactic HQ, and a bunch of grunts before getting to Cyrus for the first time. He's got a Murkrow to start off, nothing that Luxio can't handle, so I go straight for Thunderbolt, getting outsped and hit with Taunt, but that doesn't have any effect on Luxio, allowing for Golbat to come in second after the KO, going down to Thunderbolt and Volt Switch after Luxio evades an attack to come out unscathed, leaving just Sneasel as I swap into Beautyfly. I figured I'd have a good chance of either outspeeding or surviving here, doing the latter in the face of Hone Claws and one-shotting with Bug Buzz for the win. Not rough whatsoever, thankfully most of his team was not fully evolved yet. So after shuffling around my team a bit, we've got Saturn straight after, with the same team as the first fight in like Valor, which goes about how you expect. Pretty handily, not really worth talking about. Kadabra stalls out a little with Reflect, but Kadabra, Bronzor, and Toxicroak don't end up standing much of a chance against the team built to fight against them. Well, at least as best as they can based on my restrictions. This just leaves Mount Coronet and the Spear Pillar fights, and if you know me and Sinnoh runs, it's that I hate talking about the double battle at the peak against Mars and Jupiter, since too much goes on and it ends up being a 5 minute fight for something that's very minute in the grand scheme of things. However, I will talk about Cyrus again, as at least he's got a more powerful team here. 
He starts off with the newly evolved Honchkrow, but thankfully my Ghastly does the trick, as it's outsped and one shot with a Zap Plate boosted Thunderbolt. I actually needed the boost here with that Zap Plate, and thankfully that item is, is available in the Grand Underground and coming in clutch here. Second is Gyarados, and oddly enough, despite being quad weak to Thunderbolt, it actually won't go down thanks to the Held Berry that reduces super effective electric type damage. So I swap out into Graveler expecting Crunch, but because the AI can read my inputs, I'm hit with Waterfall. Instead, then swapping out into Shellos afterwards, thankfully with the AI not reading this one and getting some special attack off of Storm Drain. I hit three Ice Beams in a row before sacrificing Shellos for the greater good, because I figured I'd have to get a way to get Gyarados into healing range so that I could burn through a healing item and still be able to KO with Ghastly as it does outspeed. And sure enough, it does work, though he only uses a Super Potion, so I still just KO through the Held Berry, leading to Weavile. Yeah, uh, there's no chance in hell I'm staying in here. So I swap into Clefairy, taking a Fling with a Chopple Berry for 6 damage. Good stuff, keep the train coming. I figured I'd stay in and take a Metal Claw to see how much damage I could get off with Moonblast, and sadly enough for me, Clefairy is just short of the one-shot. So I gotta swap out one more time, taking a Metal Claw with Luxio and baiting out Dig, attempting to use Volt Switch, but to no avail. Alright, well it would be stupid not to swap into exactly Beauty Fly here, seeing as it's flying type and immune to Dig, baiting Aerial Ace in which I can just swap back into Luxio. Upon completing this loop twice, I kinda figured out that I could just swap out of Luxio on the first turn of Dig, and since Weavile outspeeds Beauty Fly, I can just click Bug Buzz and KO as he comes up, leaving just Crobat. Yeah, just Crobat with a nearly battered team, I'm sure this'll go fine. I decide to swap into my half-beaten Clefairy, dodging an Air Cutter and then swapping into Ghastly due to the likely Cross Poison that's coming, taking an Air Cutter to hit Thunderbolt in the attempt to one-shot, but it's just not enough. Hmm, well, I think I'm gonna have to do another sack here. I swap into Luxio to take an Air Cutter and I need to get a clean switch, so either I swap into one of my other team members or I let Luxio go. And since this gal's not on my radar for the final league team, Luxio falls to U-turn, allowing for Beautifly to come in at full HP, take an Air Cutter for two-thirds, following up with a Psychic to KO. Jeez, man, another two losses. Though, we still have yet to lose any members for the planned final league team, so I'm still in a pretty happy state here. Now for Dialga. How is my team going to stack up against a massive base stat total of 680? Yeah, it's just going to run away with a smoke ball. I'm going to be a wussy and run away. There's no chance of me sitting here fighting this. With that, though, all we've got is Sunny Shore City, so I make it a flyable location due to some ground-type encounters I want to grab before this battle. Those end up being Gibble and the Ravaged Path, thankfully finding it instead of Bronze Orb, seeing as I didn't grab that one from either Route 206 or the Grand Underground. And last but not least, Barboach is on Southern Route 212 using the Good Rod, giving me plenty of ground types to fight off the craziness of Sunny Sword City's Gym Trainers, eventually reaching Volkner. Once my selected team is at level 49 and edged up, I'm ready to take Volkner down. First up's Raichu, and I've got Barboach waiting in the wings for this. Since three of his four attacks are electric type, I figured it only makes sense to use the water ground type, taking Surf for neutral damage as Earthquake manages to two-shot, with Surf barely failing to do so after a Citrus Berry recovery. One down, three to go as Ambipom comes in, and thanks to this thing's moveset being entirely normal and electric type moves, I can just swap between Ghastly and Onyx theoretically to drain all 15 power points of Thunderbolt and make it effectively useless by KOing with Ghastly, though I'd rather just speed the process up by using Onyx, launching a fury of attacks like Dig and Rock Slide before swapping into Ghastly to be immune to Last Resort, going for Thunderbolt afterwards, but not after being outsped and hit with Shockwave for around two thirds. Well, at least we've got two down, out comes Octillery, and I swap into my newly acquired Gibble, though that doesn't stop Octazooka from doing around 3 fourths damage, so I swap into Barboach to sack and get a free swap into another Mon, but somehow it manages to dodge attacks twice in a row to KO with two Earthquakes, leaving just Luxray. Well, I guess Barboach just refuses to die, but you've done a great job, you can rest easy after this. Is what I would say if Barboach didn't just dodge another attack and allow for some massive damage to be accumulated on Luxray with Earthquake, allowing for the KO to take place next turn with Crunch, and giving the honors of winning the Beacon Badge to Graveler, sealing it up with a hard-hitting Earthquake. While I was expecting a few losses, thankfully nothing here ended up being from the planned League team, so we should be good to go from here on out.
There's only one major fight left from here, besides the league of course, and after running through the bare minimum of victory road trainers, I'm standing strong and ready to take on the last Barry fight and then the league itself. Thankfully for me, Barry's team is rather massively underleveled compared to the league's cap of 63, with his ace being 55, giving me at least a bit of reprieve before the final gauntlet. Barry starting out with Staraptor, finally fully evolving this thing as I go with Onyx, attempting to rock slide him out of this game and doing a great job at doing so, using two of them as pluck and close combat, do a combined half damage to Onyx to KO as Roserade comes in second. Yeah, this is an auto switch, but into what? Well, I think Staravia is the best choice here, as I can take anything he throws at at me, though I don't need to as Grass Knot misses, allowing for Aerial Ace to land for the one-shot, though Poison Point does unfortunately activate as Heracross comes in third. And as you might have expected, he just goes out to the quad weak Aerial Ace with Floatzel coming in fourth. Well, half the team is down and I haven't lost anybody, so I'm swapping into Machop, taking an Ice Fang for a little under a fourth, but of course, the second manages to freeze Machop, meaning I'm stuck here taking attacks until a surprise Brian at the end KOs the Chopster. Yeah, that was dumb, but at least I have my sturdy Graveler to come in, take a Brian, and live on 1 HP in order to KO with Earthquake, leading to Infernape second to last. Huh, I would have thought that he would have sent in Snorlax here, but alas, I swap into Onyx in order to sack and get a clean swap into Staravia, using the Intimidate ability to keep him from KOing with close combat and nailing a Brave Bird to KO, though heavy recoil is suffered here. It's made worse by the poison that is already on me, though that ends up getting expelled, so no worries on that front. Last out is Snorlax, and I need that extra damage, so Staravia is also getting sacked to a Brave Bird to do over half as Roselia comes in to attempt to finish him off with Giga Drain, barely missing the KO as he uses Yawn. Well, if there's no healing items, we're safe. And thankfully there's not, with the second Giga Drain finishing the match in a really hard-fought victory. See, I told you Barry was going to try to fuck me up at some point during this run. Alright, now to assemble the game-winning team. The plan for the beginning has been Mime Jr., Ghastly, Roselia, Beautyfly, Graveler, and Clefairy. A bunch of setup tools in the forms of Mime Jr.'s dual screens, stamp boosting move of choice here being Calm Mind and Baton Pass, Roselia's Growth, Beautyfly's Quiver Dance, and Clefairy's Cosmic Power are all viable as choices for each fight. Plus, my attackers in Ghastly, Roselia, Beautyfly, and Clefairy are all fantastic on the special side, while Graveler is here exclusively for hitting physically and for demolishing Flint specifically. Beautyfly covers Bug, Grass, Flying, and Psychic. Clefairy covers Fairy, Fire, and Electric, while Ghastly covers Fairy, Ghost, Dark, Poison, and Electric. Not too bad if I do say so myself, but it's still gonna be a miracle if I make it through this without losing the run. Leave a comment below with who you think that the team is going to drop to, or if you think I'll make it through the entirety of them. Let's do it. So first up in the gauntlet is Eren, starting with Dustox as I go with Clefairy, simply as a stall tactic. I know he can't outpace me with damage thanks to Bug Buzz, and even though he has Toxic, I'm not sure if he'll go for it. I exchanged a few flamethrowers as he uses Light Screen and Bug Buzz, finally going for Toxic as the held Petra Berry negates it, leading to a bit of a stall war between Moonlights on both sides, flamethrowers, Bug Buzzes, eventually leading to a flamethrower grabbing the KO as Clefairy has nearly full HP, going into Heracross, and attempting to one-shot it with Moonblast to no avail as it burns itself with a flame orb. Thankfully, I've brought it into healing range, and since Eren uses full restores, that burn is going straight away, though my Moonblast manages to get a high range and KO in one shot after that, so I guess I'll take it. One healing item and no losses in terms of Pokemon, a very nice match. Third out is Beautifly, going straight for Quiver Dance twice as I go for Moonlight and Flamethrower, doing half as Psychic gets dished out for some massive damage, but Flamethrower number two does the job, KOing as Vespiquen comes out fourth. Graveler is just straight up a hard wall to her, as I set up six defense curls in the face of attack order and aerial ace and all of these bug and flying moves that do absolutely nothing before rollouting into Oblivion, KOing Vespiquen in two shots and Drapion on the third attack, winning the match without a single loss. <laughs> well, shoot, maybe I can do this after all. Second up is Bertha, and I've got a really good type advantage thanks to Roselia. Immediately one-shotting Quagsire, Whizcash through a type weakening berry, and Pseudowoodo all with one Giga Drain apiece, leaving just Golem and Hippowdon. 
Golem is a bit rough since I know she'll be going for Earthquake here, so I swap into Beautifly, baiting the Stone Edge and allowing me to go into Clefairy, which I've caught Grass Knot for this occasion. Unfortunately though, Sturdy is one of those abilities that happens to trigger over and over again as more full restores are used, eventually leading to a Heavy Slam, a Steel-type move, that gets the KO on Clefairy at super effective damage, meaning I'm down to 5 members as Rosalia cleans up Golem with a Giga Drain. Hippowdon's out last, and unfortunately is also not a one-shot with Giga Drain. Probably should have seen that coming due to the lack of a secondary typing that makes a quad weak to grass, but it does bring her into the red, allowing for Earthquake to unfortunately KO Roselia, and for Ghastly to come in and grab the revenge KO with Shadow Ball to seal the deal and the win. Alright, well, I'm down to four members, but I wasn't intending on using Roselia for Flint anyway, so I should be fine for this fight at least. I go in leading Graveler against his Rapidash, this time going in with a Chesto Berry in order to immediately wake up from Hypnosis and blast him with an Earthquake to grab the KO, leading to Low Punny. Now this thing has high Jump Kick, a super effective attack on Graveler that it's likely to use, but unable to hit Ghastly whatsoever, so I can just swap back and forth twice, forcing a full restore on the Crash damage as I hit with Psychic, doing the same swapping shenanigans once more in order to KO with Psychic next turn, which leads to Steelix. Alright, well this guy has Crunch, so there's no way I'm letting Ghastly just sit here, so I swap in Graveler to take it for less than half, getting an Earthquake in and unfortunately succumbing to the 75% Iron Tail, getting KO'd and allowing Ghastly to come in and pick up the Revenge KO with a Shadow Ball. Ghastly's my last attacker here, so I'm definitely in a bad spot. Though 4th out is Drifblim, which is an easy, outsped one-shot KO with Ghastly's Shadow Ball, leaving just Infernape. Sadly though, this is the end of the line for good old Ghastly. Drifblim's Will-O-Wisp landing wouldn't have mattered except for in this exact scenario that I found myself in, with the friendship mechanic saving Ghastly on 1 HP as I land Psychic to bring Infernape's HP into the red, with Will-O-Wisp KOing between turns and leaving just my poor... Poor little Mime Jr. has no attacking moves to die after a few turns, effectively ending the run. Well geez, I didn't expect it to peter out at Flint. I honestly thought that I would be able to make it to Cynthia, but turns out trying to use Little Cup Pokemon like Ghastly in a league that's probably the hardest in the series due to competitive items like Flame Orb, Facade, Guts, Heracross, or Focus Sash on Infernape was probably not a good idea. Though, it was fun being able to try to get as far as I did. While I didn't expect it to peter out at Flint, I fully expected this run to be impossible by the time I hit Cynthia, without a nutty set of good luck and with Kadabra being unbanned per the 400 lower base stat total rule. Well, now this run's got a bad taste in my mouth. I need to wash it out with something a little bit more manageable, but still challenging. You'll like what I've got cooked up for next week. Hey there, did you enjoy the video? Well then why not click on one of these other videos on screen, you'll likely enjoy them too. And if you really enjoyed the content, why not check out some more with myself involved over on my Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon TCG channel, Chaotic Meatball TCG, and the collab channel Beast Coast Pokemon that I participate in alongside James Beck, Aaron Cybertron Zhang, and Zelios Network. Thank you to my patrons on screen, it really means the most. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.